right. <laughs> I've just gotten word that everybody on Blue Jeans can hear us. So through some miracle, I've got the lectern and the sharing from my MacBook all working together. So that's a, that's a small miracle. Who here doesn't get this reference? Because as I was doing the slides, somebody didn't actually get this reference. Who was it? Everyone's got it? <laughs> I, I, won't call, I won't name names here. Um, but yes, it's Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home, the Ruby Slippers. And if you haven't seen that movie, you really should. But uh, welcome. <laughs> I'm hoping to chat about some tips and tricks to basically make your development lives easier here. And a lot of these can be applied toward any language outside of Django. A lot of them are just basic concepts of developing at the command line. Um, we will get into some Django specifics, but uh, even if you're just developing regular Python, there are a lot of tips and tricks in here which can help you um, in developing outside of Django, too. Um, and most of these can help you just about anywhere you do development, except for maybe WordPress, but that's a different story. Um, so moving right along, ruthless efficiency is something I aim for. And uh, it wouldn't really be a Python talk without a Monty Python reference, so I've got to throw in the Spanish Inquisition. And ruthless efficiency is just really a badass way of saying it's good to be lazy. Um, and in my years as a developer, I performed a whole heck of a lot of repetitive tasks over and over and over. Um, I think about the number of times as a SQL admin I've been asked to back up a database from prod and restore it to dev, and it's, you know, just an hour of my life I won't get back every time I have to do it and remember the uh, try to use the GUI, fail at the GUI, come up, you know, go to Stack Overflow, come up with the command line for disabling all connections to SQL Server, blah, 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 blah. Repetitive, repetitive tasks. I also think of every time I log into a new server or if I'm building a vagrant box, how many times have I gone to a new machine where I'd have to set up my home environment manually, set up my bash RC the way I want it, set up my git config, configure my git config, set up my SSH keys, over and over and over. And of course, if I'm doing it manually, it would be just different enough on every box to trip me up somewhere down the road because I'd have it set up one way one place and one way another place. And uh, one great thing about Python and Django is it allows us to reuse and share a lot more easily than we have before, as well as automating. And uh, I think we started to see the benefits of that, especially through things like our project. So before we get started, I wanted to go with the Tim preferred Django project layout. After doing a, a lot, I've, I'm working on my first major, major Django project now, um, but feel like I've done sort of the hello world sort of Django tutorials and apps several thousand times. And over that, I've come to, uh, come to this project layout that, that's, that's my preferred way that I'm starting to use for all my projects. And um, at the top level, we have your My Project folder, which is what started when you do a Django admin uh, start project. Um, but rather than having a secondary folder, My Project, My Project, for all your configuration files, um, I've decided it's a lot easier to just standardize on having a config folder. That's where your whiskey.py and your urls.py goes and your routers.py. I've got some custom storages in there I've built for S3. That's where I put all my project-wide settings. And under config, I always have a settings folder. Within settings, I have a base.py, which is settings that go across all, uh, all of my Django environments, and then separate ones where they deviate from base.py for development, local, production, and test. If you've been using Django for a little bit, you're probably You've probably come to these same conclusions yourselves. Um, the problem with having my project, my project, is it's not always named my project. So rather than having a top level directory called words classroom and a secondary directory named words classroom as well, it gets confusing on whether that secondary level is actually the project settings or an app. So I figured just going with config is a much easier way to do things. It also makes it so your config setting structure is the same across all Django projects, and we'll see why that's important in a couple minutes. I also do a separate folder for my requirements files. The, and again, the same theory here. Base.txt contains, contains the Python and Django packages I want to install across all of the environments. Then dev.txt dev contains, it does an include of everything in base and also includes things that just go to dev, like debug toolbar, IPython, uh, Django extensions, other tools that are just being used in development that you really don't want going out to production. 
Another thing I do here too, you'll see there's an aws.txt, a mssql.txt, a postgresql.txt. Anytime there's a feature I want to add to a Django website like AWS that requires more than one Python package, I put them into a separate text file. So for example, AWS requires two packages. It requires a package called BOT03, which is how Python talks to AWS, and Django Storages, which is how Django talks through BOT03 to AWS. By keeping them each in an individual file, when it's time to upgrade, I know I should upgrade them both at the same time and make sure they play nicely together. So it's just kind of a, uh, a dummy reminder for me that whenever, or, or you know, with MS SQL, it contains, the, again, the Python layer and the Django layer, two separate packages. When I upgrade one, I want to make sure it plays well with the other. So it's just a constant reminder because I'm not good at remembering everything I've ever done, especially when it comes to setting up packages and configuring them that when I upgrade one of these, I want to pay special attention to the other. Then at the root, I also keep a git ignore. Manage.py does a whole lot of magic. And uh, some of the other ones, some of you are familiar with, uh, package.json, pytest.any for uh, my test exception list, um, webpack, and then tasks.py. Uh, a bunch of us have heard of Fabric. Uh, Fabric was mainly for Python 2, and it did both automated tasks and SSH calls all wrapped up into one package. The author of Fabric has kind of separated them into the Python 3 world to have a task runner and the SSH connector separately in two packages called Invoke and Paramico. And I use these to do all kinds of other repetitive tasks like uh, while we were waiting for, while we're waiting for what we're going to end up for continuous integration and publishing. Um, I've built a publisher just into the invoke command, which makes it very easy for me to publish in the meantime, which really is uh, similar to what we're doing with Jenkins, where it sort of just uh, ends up running a bash script at the end of the day that does the magic. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit. So that's sort of the default project layout that everything else I'm going to show you sort of revolves around. So my home directory. We can... Uh, we can hop out of slide mode here. And I'll show you what I've done. This is my GitHub account. And I've actually just created a repository on my GitHub account that contains my home folder. And since I can never remember Git commands, and we'll get into that in a minute, I've also included exactly what I need to copy and paste as soon as I log on to a server for the first time. So what I can do here, I can literally type in T. Allen and my password on any server, run these commands, after getting my SSH keys in place, because you don't want to commit your SSH keys to GitHub, and I'm ready to go. Um, what I've got in here are a standard git config, a git ignore, and I will show you some of them now. So if I come over here, I'll do it here where it's nice and big. If I come over here to my home directory, and I take a look at my bash RC, this has grown over time, and the nice thing is anytime I figure out a trick on any server, I can just commit it and pull it back down. So you'll see uh, some things here which are probably unique to me within the organization, like uh, Emacs is the greatest operating system ever, so I set my default editor to Emacs. I don't recommend it unless you're absolutely insane like me. Setting up NPM in a standard way across all your servers. Um, you'll also notice on GitHub, I have a scale directory. So I've got a bash RC here for Vagrant. But I might also want one for a different server type, for example, where I don't have Postgres installed. But for now, I've just got the Vagrant one, which I then copy in after the fact. I set my global prefixes. I set my directory colors. Now, this is a cool one. You can set up all kinds of aliases. And this is a handy Python command. So when I'm on servers where they might not have um, an easy way to access. I have alias the sharedir command. So what that does, I can literally type sharedir from anywhere. And this is all my local host. Now I can go to my local host on 8000, and there's my home directory. So through a browser, I can literally get to any folder I want just from the command line there. And that can come in handy sometimes. Coming back to bash rc, you'll see I've got my virtual env wrapper set up. 
as well as uh, tab completion for Git. This is something that doesn't happen out of the box for everyone. And uh, I found it very handy. So when you're completing long feature branch paths, paths and things like this, this is pretty much installed on any machine you're going to find. But adding it to your .bashrc file will give you tab completion for Git just by adding that one line. And it really makes life a lot easier, especially if you have as many branches as I typically do. There are a couple checks here that I've just added over time. And again, you know, I don't have to stack overflow them every time now. They're just part of my working environment. Check the window size after each command in case I'm resizing my Emacs windows or anything like that. And other useful aliases here. So run server, rather than having to type that whole thing every time, I now just type run server. And also the ccat command. I installed Python pigments at the root of uh, every server I have. And pigments can handle hundreds of different types of language extensions. So I now have a colored cat command. So for example, if I come into Vagrant and I want to view my bootstrap.sh, I can just type ccat bootstrap.sh, pipe more, and you'll see it'll give me a full syntax highlighting on all the formats it recognizes. It recognizes every language I've used so far except for SAS. But uh, we'll get Joe Doherty right on that. So if we keep scrolling down beyond that, you'll see what I've got here is a little more advanced. So I've got dev manage and local manage. We're running Postgres, which is nice, because it allows us to have a shared development server that we use throughout the team. So for example, when we're putting content into a CMS or something, that can all be shared. But I also have a local server right on my Vagrant machine as well. So what this allows me to do is have easy access to both of them without having to type out the settings file each time. Config settings local versus config settings dev. Tim. Yes. What is the difference between dev and local for you? So we have a central Postgres server that is run by the word systems team for dev Postgres. So I can connect to that as can Charles, as can Ted, as can the other members of the team. For the local Postgres server, only I can have access to that because they don't have access to my Vagrant box. OK, so local really is local, and dev is sort of your development integration? Yes, it, it's, an, it's basically the integration, da integration database, which is a nice change of pace. Um, because, for example, within local, what I can do then, if I'm changing around models and I'm not sure where I'm going and I'm creating all kinds of crazy migrations, I can do that all at the local database level and completely tear it up without affecting another developer, get everything the way I need it, and then build my migrations the right way. So rather than committing 20 migrations where I might add a column, remove a column, change a column name, change a column type, figure different things out, I can get it all right and then delete all the migrations that I had created in local and create one that works. Then commit that to dev and you get one commit for the migration rather than maybe 20 where you're you know, playing around trying to figure out the best way to do it. So that's been very handy for me. And the shortcuts allow me to do stuff. So local server will fire up against my local Postgres database. Come on, don't fail me now. <laughs> Live coding is always an adventure. All right, so you can see here, oh wait, I can do this. I've never used this before. Where's the annotate? OK, maybe I can't. But you can see config settings local over here. And uh, if I do the same thing for dev, you'll see it will connect to our central dev server. Apparently, we have a very slow connection. So you'll see config settings dev. If we go into the actual settings here, config settings dev, 
I won't actually bring it down because there are passwords in there. There shouldn't be. They should be in environment files. But um, the settings there set to go against localhost versus our central dev server words PG1 dev. So those are some tricks I do in my bash RC file, which have uh, really made my life easier. Another nice thing is I've got manage.py commands for all of them. So if I want to look at local manage.py, I just shortcutted it to Loma, uh, show migrations. This will show me a list of all the migrations I've run against the local database. Then I can do the same thing against the dev database. So there are all the ones for local. And if I do the same thing against dev. So especially when I'm working on a migration, working on changes to the Django models, it's very handy here to see what I've run against local versus what I've run against dev and plan out a strategy for the best way to get an easy to run migration because you want to keep your migrations as simple as possible. Uh, migrated out to dev to sort of the integration database and then eventually all the way out to production. All right, so that's my bash RC. Another handy thing that I've got that I pull down everywhere is my git config. How many times have you gone to a new box and you pull down your git repo and you're all ready to go uh, to do a commit and then you get that command to set your username and email and amend the commit you just made? It's happened to me over a hundred times. So um, this has made it a lot easier. Right within here, I get all my git config settings. So I set up my name, I set up my email, I put in the coloring I like for git diffs and git branches, so I get full colorized interactive git commands. Uh, my favorite git merge tool, I'm gonna pep eight that while I'm here, uh, emerge. And then um, I also like to put in git aliases. And git aliases are really handy because a lot of the git commands we have to issue on a regular basis require stack overflow or some insane kind of memory that's way better than mine. So. I want to see the last commit that happened. I just do git last rather than git log dash one head. <laughs> I want to unstage the thing I just did by mistake. Git unstage rather than reset space head space dash dash. So anytime I go to Stack Overflow more than three times for a git command, probably a good idea to add it to here. Also shortcuts for checking out branch, CI for commit, ST for status. It just makes life a lot easier. And then I have it everywhere I need it to be. Because uh, I've spent an awful lot of time on Stack Overflow or pinging Courtney over Twitter direct messages asking how to do things with Git. And once I get it down once, this will provide a very easy way for me to do it over and over. So before I forget, we've now got a change in my home directory. I've got a Git status. I've modified Git config. I'm going to pep eight that. Push it up to GitHub. And now I can pull it down everywhere else and I'll be PEP8 compliant even though it's just a git, con git config file. <laughs> so not really required. Another thing I do here on my home directory one, git ignore star. So basically that says, it's a, it's a safety net for me. It says ignore everything in this folder. So if I want to add something to my skeleton home directory, I have to do git add dash F for force to make it add. So it's a safety net that I don't accidentally do git add all and end up, you know, adding my .ssh folder or anything like that. So it's very, very much a safety net. So that's my home directory. But now we can move on to a couple more fun things that that allows us to do. So again, getting back to being lazy and invoking the principle of least effort, Pi Invoke really helps with this. And as I mentioned, it was formerly known as Fabric, and it works very well with Paramico for SSH connections. You basically create a tasks.py file for doing things. I use it for things like uh, running my test suite, uh, building docs, or you know, publishing out to a number of servers. And uh, I use it mainly for anything that might not need specifics from the Django environment itself, uh, more for repetitive systems tasks. So uh, let's take a quick look at my tasks.py. If you take a look in here, 
it makes it very easy. And you'll see I'm immediately pulling from Invoke, Task, and Run, and from Paramico, an SSH client, and an auto add policy. So the auto add policy allows you the first time to basically, um, if you SSH to a new server and it says that key has not already been added, do you want to add it? Yes, this will automatically skip that step and add it. So I set out here my destination servers in a number of lists for dev, stage, and prod, as well as what branches correspond to those instances. I've got a task here for building the documentation. And you can see it's, again, just another simple task. But what this will do is anytime I build my docs, it will automatically make them in HTML format the doc store I'm setting up, which is set up up here. And then it will automatically open them with the default opener. Um, open the Sphinx documentation in your browser is pretty self-explanatory. For test and full test, you'll see I have a bunch of settings here with PyTest. So when I run invoke test, it'll just run pi.test. It'll reuse the existing DB. It won't worry about migrations. And it'll get off and running at the base dir with the test settings. So the test settings, by default, are config settings test. So most of the time, I can just type invoke test, and it'll run my entire test suite. And again, the pytest.ini I have at the base. Um, in there, I defined what folders not to go down to. So what this will do is automatically go into every app I have and look for a test folder and run the test suite from in there. If I want to run a full test, I've also built that in place so it doesn't do a reuse DB. Again, these command line options, how many times in your life have you had to do a command dash dash help to get a list of commands? It's much easier to just build out your own. How to build out test coverage, it's right there. And then also the publisher I've built. So what this publisher will do is take an instance, dev stage or prod, and actually go through all the commands to publish it. So this is similar to what we did with Bass scripts. Um, the way I've set this up <laughs> is pretty ugly versioning. It's got the two previous publishes and the two previous virtual ends. But until we decide on a successor to Jenkins, it's working for us now. And it got it out the door. So if I wanted to publish from here right now, uh, all I'd have to do is invoke publish instance equals dev. And I also made it so you can add a verbose flag to see what's going on. And that'll publish out to our central dev server. And you'll see it'll actually clone the repository. It'll collect static files. It'll run migrations. It'll install in a brand new virtual M. So anytime you publish here, it builds everything from the ground up. So it pulls a fresh version from the developed repository and does a full pip install on a brand new virtual M. So that way, when you're integrating at dev, you make sure you absolutely haven't missed anything. So Invoke's become a very, very handy tool to have in my tool set. As you can see, there it goes. It's a successfully installed. There's the pip install dash r. If I didn't include the verbose, it just includes a couple nice static updates, like collecting static files instead of dumping the output of each. But it is handy to see the output of each so you can see what's actually going on. So just because, I, I don't know if this is an appropriate question, but you're running inside Vagrant and you're kicking off other virtual machines. So this actually isn't kicking off. This is running inside Vagrant, but it's not kicking off virtual machines. What it's actually. I just said VM. I, mis I misheard you. What did I say? Did I say v uh, virtual env? ENV, sorry. Oh. <laughs> I should have clarified. Yeah, what this is actually doing, it creates a new virtual end each time. Okay. So what it's doing is actually going out to one of our central, our centralized dev server right. as um, through SSH keys, uh, uh, the Apache user. It goes out there. It creates a new virtual env. It does a pip install fresh in the new virtual env. And then drops the old virtual ends, moves them back. So we have the two previous virtual ends along with the two corresponding code bases, and then installs the new one. So by doing it all in advance, it's just a file handle swap, and then we're live. So you're not overriding an old file code base or anything like that. 
So you don't get that, you, you don't get in that stage where it takes five minutes to publish and during that five minutes, it's half new, half old. It just does a file handle swap. So the other nice thing about doing it this way is we can tinker with it easily here. And once it's done and we find the successor to Jenkins, we'll be able to migrate the exact concept we've done here to Jenkins or whatever we go with in the Atlassian stack or whatever the choice might be, Jenkins 2.0. Um, but it's a nice way to tinker and get it right. And as you can see, the publish is now done. So this is another trick that I've got in my tool book, and that's IPython. And I couldn't resist using this graphic because uh, IPython can help you herd a lot of cats. IPython is a replacement for the command line Python, um, which gives you a lot of nice tools. Um, it's a lot easier to use at the command line. It's got a much better history. It's got a multi-line history. But it's also got a great thing called embedded mode. And now this can be used with Django, but it can also be used anywhere with Python. And uh, this is really pretty amazing. So it's best shown by example. So if I open up here, and I've got my Classroom by Words website, which I should probably fire up Run Server for. So I'm firing up my dev server. And of course, this was lightning fast back at my desk. All right, there we go. And I fire up my dev server. <laughs> there we go. So I've got my Words Classroom website. And let's say that I want to do some debugging. In the past, a lot of the times in cold fusion land, I've done a CF dump. In Python, I've done a print statement. I've done all these kinds of things before. And uh, one nice thing about having your own run server on your own machine is you literally can inject yourself into the HTTP request response stream. You can do this in any Python. Um, but for an example, If we come over to our views, you'll see I've set the title to Classroom by Words in here, just a simple bit of the context. And what I can do is pull in the embed command from IPython and embed. And I'll go ahead and save that. And then you'll see over here, I've got my run server ready to go. And it refreshes. I think blue jeans is uh, taxing my laptop because it's getting very, very hot. But you'll see here, this is still spinning, right? And you'll see run server here has kicked me into IPython. So what I've done is literally injected myself into the point where I embedded in that view. So if I want, from here, I'll import pretty print. If I want to print out my context, I can print out the entire context that is being passed to the template right from there. I can even change it. So if we want to change that title, I can change it. And again, we're still spinning over here, but as soon as I quit with the change context, it'll revert back to run server from that embed, hopefully. And there you go. And you'll see classroom by words now says hello world. So that's a pretty handy trick that replaces a lot of years of print statements, embedding, breakpoints. The fact you can literally say, pause right here where I'm getting stuck. Let me fiddle around with the current state that's typically, you know, embedded somewhere deep in Apache and then quit out and just have it pick up where you were is uh, one of the nicest new tricks as a developer that this whole platform has given me. It, 
you know, being able to just inject like that right in the middle of an HTTP request response really is a game changer for me. So that's some of the stuff that IPython can give you. Yeah, that embed tool is great. Also, if you're just learning Django, I remember when I was first learning Django, just like knowing from a framework, like what's sitting in what structures and which objects, and just being able to throw that embed statement and then just spitting it out, just to know like, okay, this is where I am in the code, it's yeah. really useful. It's really handy for being able to see how Django passes information around. That's, that's a very good point, Jeff. Um, the other nice thing about it sometimes is when you put an embed statement somewhere and it doesn't stop, then you know that code's not being hit, <laughs> which is uh, sometimes the best indicator you could want. So manage.py commands. Manage.py comes with a whole set of commands that we are probably pretty used to now. Making migrations, showing migrations, run server itself is just a command. But you can also build your own commands. And uh, there are a fair amount of extensions out there for commands you can get out of the box, which will make your life a lot easier. Um, like I said before, one of the common occurrences as a SQL admin uh, was backing up and restoring databases. So I like this example, because I think just about everyone in this room at some point has had to make a request of a SQL admin where we had to do something manual that probably shouldn't be a manual process. So what I wanted with the New Words Classroom project was a way for us to take our prod database and restore it to dev, or take our dev database and restore it to my local. Again, with me, with me having a dev and a local database and tinkering around on my local database, I want to be able to blow it away or refresh it from our dev central server that we all share to local as much as possible. So I built a management command around that. And if we take a look, One thing I also do for every project is I just create, here it's called words, I create a single app that holds site project-wide information. So management commands, your homepage templates, uh, any template tags you use across the site, I just create one app without any specific purpose other than carrying that. So if we look in commands, you'll see I created this DB copy and what it takes is what database do you want to use? The DSN name defined in Django, typically default. What do you want the source to be? What do you want the target to be? And then it dumps it and restores it. So if I'm over here and I do manage.py db copy help, you'll see it gives you a nice layout, as well as this command will copy the database from one environment to another. Be careful. And this database will be overridden with the source environment database. Be careful. And I also put in a catch within it. I believe I put in a catch somewhere that says, yes, if target equals prod, the target database cannot be production, just because I know someday when in a rush, I would do something very stupid. So putting in those kinds of caches to make sure that you know you can't take dev and restore it to prod is good. That's something where you might want it to be a manual process if you're really going to do something like that. Um, so rather than fat fingering something. But if I go ahead and do a manage.py db copy uh, source equals prod target equals dev. I'm going to overwrite all the changes Charles has been working on hard this morning and uh, go ahead and run it. It'll take a minute as it's backing up prod. Okay, prod's been backed up. We're about to completely overwrite the words classroom database on host words pg1 dev dash w dot word note private. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes. And there within a few seconds I've taken my prod database my prod database and restored it to dev. Bam bam. So that takes an hour and makes it a matter of seconds. One of the packages I was talking about that's a handy extension is uh, called Django Extensions, which gives you all kinds of handy commands to make your development life easier. So this one does what are called entity relationship diagrams, ERDs. 
which will take all your Django models and how your forum keys are set up and give you a nice graphical representation. This has been really handy for me as a developer, where I can just give it a list of apps I'm working on, print it out, and it will show me all the relations, like the related names and everything. So when I'm working with the Django ORM, I can literally walk from one side to the other and build fairly nice single queries that do everything I need them to. So as a quick example, I've got Django extensions installed. I'll leave that up and running. So I'll do a pip list, make sure I have Django extensions installed, and yes I do. So I'm going to go ahead and do manage.py graph models, and I'll give it a couple apps. So each of these are a Django app. I've got a users app, a faculty app, a courses app, and a CMS grid app. I'll go ahead and map them all into a handy little PNG. And it'll take a few seconds, but I already cooked one up. Okay, it's redone. But you'll see here now, I actually have a full entity relationship diagram of how those apps work together. This is really handy because if you take a look, it gives you, for example, right here, faculty is related to course through that relation right there, course classroom tools. So if I want to do a select related, which is basically like a join, there's what I need to do. So I can then build out, build out fairly complex queries all by using the ORM. Um, let me find a good example of one of them. Here's an example of that. So within here, you can see I'm doing a select related, which is basically a join through classroom tool, through grid item to the summary image, which joins everything in between. And in the other direction to the course, filters are basically your where clause. So I'm saying where active equals true and where course dot faculty dot ID is the user ID and where the course is also active. So you can do a lot of walking just by looking at the image map and then putting it together. After you've done it two or three times, it becomes very natural to do it this way. And just having that visual representation in front of you is a very, very big help. And nice thing to have sort of out of the box um, with all the relations intact that just shows you how to walk from one part to the other. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another neat trick you can do with the ORM is queries are lazily evaluated. And what that means in English is that you can do all of this building you want of queries, and until it's actually used, the query itself isn't executed. So that becomes handy in cases like this. So I've looked at my map and I've decided I've got a query which is 90% the same except in some cases I want it to be a faculty user and in some cases I want it to be a student user. So what I've done here, I've built up my entire query except for the magic that checks whether we're looking at a faculty member or a student member. So what I've done is built context classroom tools equals this whole query and then down here I just put in an if clause and add on one more filter. So I add another part to the where clause here, where I'm saying, OK, if it's a faculty member, we want to check course faculty relation ID is the user ID. If it's a student, we want to set course students ID equals user ID. So this keeps our code from repeating itself. When I had first done this, I had copied the entire, um, the entire ORM query builder from one to the other. And then I noticed that was a lot of repetitive code. But looking at the ORM, you can simplify that really all I'm changing here is one item of the where clause. 
And by doing it this way, since it's lazily evaluated, I can do it differently for the different cases and then return the context where it will go through to get evaluated. It's looking at those entity diagrams that makes those kinds of things obvious on you know, how much you're repeating. So Django extensions is definitely worth checking out. And um, that's most of what I had. Um, I wanted to leave plenty of times for Q&A. Um, I encourage you to take my home directory, feel free to fork it, make it your own. And uh, it's been a really handy way that's automated a lot more of my development life and made things a lot easier. So thanks a lot. Any questions? <laughs> Also, all of this is, you know, I'm willing to share it with anybody, open source, whatever you want. A lot of it's, some of it's up on GitHub, some of it's up on the Wharton stash, so I'd be more than happy. I know I move fast, but if anybody has any questions or sees something here that they think might help them with a project, I'm more than willing to help you out. Go ahead. I agree, there was a lot of, it was, a, it was an information rich presentation, thank you. Um, is this recorded so people could go back if they didn't quite get it yet? I'm looking at a red button that says recording, so I sure hope so. <laughs> it is blinking at me right now. So yeah, I think it should be recorded if you want to go back and see different parts of it. Yeah, do you use, uh, I noticed you use Sublime. Do you use any, any packages at all, or is that just Vanilla Sublime? Yeah, I use a lot. There's actually, I think Andrew actually did it. I'll give a shout out to Andrew. Andrew put a great configuring Sublime uh, section up on Confluence. The Sublime one might have been Sam. Oh, maybe it I was Sam. For Adam, I, I think at one point I saw last modified by Andrew, but I might have tweeted it, yeah. but take the credit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I use a pretty simple Sublime setup, but I do use Anaconda and Genera, um, which is really handy. And I'll show that to you. That's actually something I meant to show that I skipped over. Um, Anaconda and Genera are really handy in showing you um, sticking with PEP8 things you may have missed, like packages you import that you're not using anymore. So for example, um, a friend of mine who writes code does not use linters or Gennaro. And uh, if I bring up, what's a good one? That one I've cleaned up, and Frontier. Oh, apparently I don't have it set up on my Mac. It's set up on my other machine. I use this machine mainly for presentations, so I don't have it set there. But what it does, it does a really nice job of underlying where you might have something that won't break your code. Sometimes it will. But uh, where you're breaking away from PEP8, I always turn off the 80 character <laughs> limit, in all honesty. Um, but it'll also show you a ton of things like uh, you know, where you're missing white space around operators, where you have too much white space around operators. So getting into PEP8 is very nice for consistency. It's made my life a lot easier getting everybody onto PEP8. Um, but more importantly, it shows you where you've imported packages that aren't used, uh, which again increases your memory footprint unnecessarily for a, requ a request and can really slow things down, especially if you're using big packages. Uh, so that's been very handy in keeping our code base clean is the real-time feedback. Because you can fix it as you're writing rather than you know, having to go back and actually analyze it, having those rules in place is nice. So I'd highly recommend Anaconda and Gennaro and the Confluence page uh, instructions make it really easy. This may be a follow on, it may not. Um, for the JavaScript world, I'm seeing a lot of Airbnb uh, litter. Do you do that with Sublime, Adam, whatever? How do you maintain your compliance with such restrictions? For Airbnb? I mean, for JavaScript or for? I, Airbnb only applies to JavaScript. OK. So like Pep8 for? Yeah. Um, I really don't do that much with JavaScript, to be honest. Anybody else doing Does Airbnb? anyone have tips for? I know what Airbnb is. Yeah, I'm sure that. Oh, it's a whole bunch of, you must have exactly so many spaces on this line, or you will fail your um, linter RC. Oh, no. <laughs> 
that I don't know. I know it's a big deal to the Python community because it gets enforced at a syntax level. That's the Pep8. Yeah. Well, Pep8 isn't entirely forth, enforced at a syntax level, but things like, um, you know, four spaces per line, proper indentation, it, it's key to the language. And by, I, I think enforcement is a good idea. That's just my personal preference. Um, because I'm a recovering Perl coder, and <laughs> if you see what people do to, with, at Perl for enough years, you come to appreciate consistency and enforce consistency. Um, you know, with Perl, for many years, you know, I'd get to a line of code that was doing 27 things very cleverly on one line and be like, you know, what kind of idiot would do this undocumented on one line? And then I go back to version control and see that eight years ago, that idiot was me. <laughs> so Python forces me not to be that idiot as well, which is something I like. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Anyone have any other things to share along these veins of tips and tricks you use in your home development environments? I'm just really glad you added graphics support to the um, Vagrant package because that made it possible to generate the ORI. Yeah, it's, it's a really handy, a very, very handy thing to have. And Django Extensions has a whole lot more. If you take a look at the list of what Django Extensions offers, they have like an alternate dev server in there, an alternate shell, um, and documentation. Actual documentation. So if you look at the current command extensions, shell plus, admin generator, it, so it basically generates all the admin.py files based off your models classes. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can use within here. And um, as you know, cookie cutter is also a great way to get projects started in that sort of default project format I set up. Um, it's just made my life easier all around. Pet checker, reset a user's password. There's there's all kinds of handy little utils in here that just uh, that just aren't in the main one. SQL diff is pretty pretty nice. So there's a whole bunch of handy things. All right. If there are no more questions, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks, and uh, I guess we can hit an early lunch or something. All right, thanks everyone.